to turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. For the next four years, the mainstream press is going to focus on Donald Trump and his presidency picking out the most inflammatory soundbite and uh, of the day and, and, uh, and sending it all around. And however, what you need is serious prophetic analysis of what's going on in the world, especially uh, now that we're now that we've passed through the electoral process. Does anybody else need a Bible? If you need a Bible, put your hands up. Or hand. <laughs> okay, we've got more Bibles here. Alright? Uh, no one really took Mr. Trump seriously when he announced his bid for the presidential, presidential nomination. However, he managed to outstrip 16 other Republican challengers to reach the Republican nomination. This political novice also managed to defy all the statistics, all the political analysts, and all the elites who tried to discredit him at every turn, and he still won the presidency anyway, against a well-heeled, well-financed globalist who had the much more political experience and influence. Just think about what he's actually accomplished. How did he do it? That's the question. Well, that doesn't, that's not really our concern. But he did it basically by, by uh, offering angry people um, a solution to their anger. That's really what it was. No president of the United States, however, can escape the serious prophetic nature of the office. Prophecy has so much to do with the U.S. Constitution and with the role of the United States that the actions of the president are especially significant. And while other world leaders also have a play in prophecy, the United States is mentioned in Revelation 12 as the place of refuge for God's persecuted church. The earth, or the wilderness place, helped the woman, or God's church, and opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had cast out of his mouth. You remember that from Revelation 12, verse 16. It is also mentioned in Revelation 13 as joining with Rome and eventually, um, and instead, acting like, uh, instead of acting like a lamb, it will speak as a dragon or as Satan to achieve papal purposes. It will, not, it will become a persecuting power to those that do not go along with the religious laws that will be imposed during a significant crisis. Therefore, the United States has a special place in fulfilling prophecy. Whether you favor the Trump presidency or a Clinton presidency, the fact is the office of president of the United States will always have a significant influence on prophecy and prophetic developments. Now let me give you a little history, or a little background. When I took on Keep the Faith Ministry more than 12 years ago, the United States President was who? George Bush. W. Bush. When we analyzed his prophetic role, some criticized us as being anti-Republican and anti-Bush. We just simply explained the prophecies. And people got angry with us. In fact, one man said, it was in one of my meetings, and he stood up and he says, you're just reading the leftist press. And he stomped out of the meeting. <laughs> he didn't wait to hear the answer. <laughs> I read both the left and the right. Because you know why? It's a very important reason. If you're going to have balance in Bible prophecy, in terms of Bible prophecy, you need to read the literature from the left, and you need to read the literature from the right. And perhaps some things in between. The reason is, is because the left tattles on the right. And the right tattles on the left. 
So that's how you get to the, to the real root of things, mm -hmm. is you look at what, who they're, what they're saying against the other side. <laughs> so that's why you read the left and the right. You read both. If you're going to be a balanced Bible student and understand prophecy, you cannot just read one side or the other. And you cannot be biased, because you're, the one you might favor is certainly going to have prophetic significance. Okay. Well, anyway, the Bush presidency was very prophetic because President Bush was very aggressive in undermining the U.S. Constitution during the War on Terror, you may remember. Um, and he was also, he also had a lot of Roman Catholic advisors all around him. You wonder how much they had to pay in all of that. He was especially interested in following their counsel. He invited the bishops to come and be with him and around him. And he appointed their, their recommended people to his cabinet and, and other official appointments. And one wonders how much the waterboarding of captured Muslim extremists was motivated or justified by these connections. After all, torture in secret prisons was, in fact, a Roman Catholic practice in the Middle East. And here we are under President Bush, resurrected. Oh, you're anti-Bush and you're anti-Republican. That's what they said. Do you have a Bush one or two? Two. Okay. Twelve years ago. Okay. Oh, we, we weathered that. You know, we're still here. <laughs> but then, guess who was elected president next? Barack Obama. When President Obama was elected to become the 44th President of the United States, we started our focus on prophecy once again and the role that he was playing. Supporters of Mr. Trump began accusing us and criticizing us for our prophetic coverage again. This is an interesting experience, you understand. Some of them even accused us of racism. Yeah. You know, I had a woman come to me. I said, sister, what do you mean? Oh, you roasted Mr. Obama. And I said, oh, okay. I said, sister, have you been a subscriber to Keep the Faith for any length of time? Oh, yes, we've been a subscriber for many years, she said. Well, I said, then you would know that I roasted President Bush over and over and over again. She said, well, yeah, I guess you're right. She backed off. She said, no. But anyway, people criticized. The bottom line is that, um, again, President Obama had a part to play in prophecy. We aren't interested in politics. We're interested in prophecy. Amen. Amen. Again, this had nothing to do with race. It had to do with religion and the fulfillment of prophecy. Um, and so in, during Obama's term, we saw the first salvo. Get this. We saw the first salvo of a major attack on religious liberty through the Obamacare or Affordable Care Act and also through the legislation relating to and court cases and all that relating to same-sex marriage and the homosexual rights movement that is currently going on in America. So now we're ready to embark on a new presidential term. And my, I'm wondering what kind of criticisms we're going to get this time. Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not going to be surprised at all, brother. Mm. <laughs> I've had already, I've already had people criticize us, by the way, for our prophetic coverage of Mr. Trump, mm. <laughs> because it's amazing to me how many Adventists support him and how many Adventists voted for him. Have mercy. Oh, I'm telling you, my friends. This man is absolutely dangerous, and you'll see why in a minute. From a prophetic point of view, nothing to do with racial stuff, you know, and other political big things. Business. That big business, all of that, that has nothing to do with what I'm going to be talking about today. I think you need to understand the dangerous position that America is in right now as we come to the to the dawn of the Trump era. So let us begin by reading our verses in Revelation 13, 
and we'll look at verse 11 and onward. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 and onward. The Bible says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound is healed. Now what was the purpose here? Worship. To worship. Worship the first beast. Who's the first beast? The papacy. And the second beast is? America. And Protest Protestant America, if we can put it more precisely. Apostate Protestant America. <laughs> okay, we can add the adjectives in there. Anyway, all right. So now, as we read on, the Bible says, and he deceived them, verse 14, oh, sorry, verse 13. Um, just a minute. Yeah, did we finish reading verse 12? Let's just read verse 12 again. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. Yes, we did this one. Whose deadly wound was healed. All right, 13. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Some people think that means nuclear you know, bombs. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We'll see how it all plays out. Verse 14. He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So there's going to be something very important that's going to happen that's going to be perceived as miraculous. A nuclear bomb is not perceived as miraculous. It may be powerful, but it's not miraculous. This is something that is miraculous. It's beyond the capacity of normal human beings to accomplish, okay? Saying to them to dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, the first beast, which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now there's a death penalty for you. If you're faithful to Christ, you will get the death penalty if you live that long. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So in other words, there'll be all economic sanctions, there'll be death penalties, there'll be persecution, and, you know, if you are living at that time, you need Jesus. Amen. Amen. More than anything else, you need Christ. And we better start working on getting that sorted out now, because if we don't get it out, sorted out now, we're not going to be able to sort it out at the last minute. Amen. Yes, there will be 11th hour workers, but friends, if you continually resist the Holy Spirit today, you will continue to resist Him then. You don't want to do that. Amen. Now listen to this. This is from Great Controversy, page 607. Great Controversy 607. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light lest it should shine upon their flocks. Amen. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, papists and Protestants Unite. Amen. And they're already uniting, aren't they? Yeah. And I want to point this out because the ecumenical movement under Pope Francis is happening right now. It's being matured to the point where there isn't going to be anybody left pretty soon that's not involved in the ecumenical movement. In fact, who is the ecumenical movement really targeting ultimately? Seven keepers, God's people. That's right. The ecumenical movement starts off with the Orthodox and the, and the Anglicans and then other the others. And, and since Pope Francis came along, the Pentecostals have now joined up with the ecumenical movement. You know, Kenneth Copeland and uh, James Robeson and others who have you know gone head over heels over Pope Francis. You know, so who's left? You know, I mean, even the Orthodox, he finally reconciled, I wouldn't say reconciled, but he's starting to have dialogue now with the fifth of the five Orthodox communions. The first four, he already, they're already 
and they're working on their unity issues. But the fifth one, the Russian Orthodox Patriarchate, was holding itself aloof because of offenses that had occurred between the Catholics and the Orthodox right after 1989 when the Berlin Wall came down. But anyway, uh, and now he's reconciled with that. You don't realize what happened with that? Pope Francis, Pope Francis is amazing. His commitments are very close to the ecumenical movement. He loves the ecumenical movement. He's, he's working hard to mature it and strengthen it. This is very important because under the circumstances that Donald Trump, um, but let me come back to that. We'll hold off on that statement for just a minute. He's been, the Pope's been very busy trying to bring in all these churches. And after the Pentecostals, he brought in the Evangelicals. Did you notice? Uh, Rick Warren went to the Vatican to be involved in a conference, and he came away with a video saying, we have to work with Rome, even though we have some differences. We have to work with Rome. We have to join, unite with them, and solve these problems of the earth, you know, and marriage, and this and that. Others, Joel Osteen, hmm, was over in Rome, visiting with them. Oh, yeah. And, um, and there were other megachurch leaders. I don't remember all their names, but they've gone over there also, these megachurch pastors. So how are we to understand this, you know, in light of our times? Well, this is the whole thing. We, churches de-emphasize their distinctive doctrines mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. so that they can unite together. Mm. But Seventh-day Adventists have the most distinct of all and they cannot do this, even though some might try. They'll never, true Adventists will never unite with Rome. So, ultimately, those who are isolated by the ecumenical movement are the, are the true followers of Christ. Sabbath keepers. Now, every nation on earth, sorry, the angels, first we'll talk about the angels. The angels were very interested in the election because globalization had risen to the point that it was perhaps threatening to cut off the preparation of God's church and God's people and that need to get ready for the coming crisis and God wanted to give them more time. I don't know. That's a possibility. Yeah, it helps. That's right. And nearly every nation on earth was also watching carefully to see how the outcome would affect their geopolitical relations. People everywhere around the globe were very interested in who the American people would elect in their next presidency. What they saw and what they read of media propaganda about <coughs> Donald Trump, and by the way, whether you believe the media's story or not, they're largely propaganda. And the same is true, their propaganda for Hillary Clinton is also Propaganda. It's not necessarily factual, as you will see in a minute. Anyway, people everywhere were interested, and they were reading the, whatever, they were, whatever they saw and read about the propaganda of, uh, about Donald Trump alarmed them, but also convinced them that the Americans would likely bow to reason and elect Hillary Clinton as their next president. <laughs> After all, Donald Trump was so radical and absurd, mm -hmm. so out of step with inclusiveness and modern liberal thinking, mm -hmm. and uh, they even accused him of racism, which may be true, you know. They thought it impossible that he would be elected president. Mm -hmm. That's right. They That's thought right. the Americans yeah. would have common sense. That's right. Yeah. That's, That's right, right. Hillary. Oh no boy. Right. When they woke up on November 9 to discover that Hillary had lost the maverick to a maverick businessman that everyone supposedly loved to hate, they went into a funk. <laughs> the whole world went into a funk. Yeah. And sometimes, in some places, they're still going into a funk yeah. on yeah. Uh, yeah. Donald Trump. Especially universities, by the way. Mm. And the students at university, they're in this, this funk. <laughs> anyway, yeah. it's not just a funk, by the way. That thing is, the, the, the protests are being funded. And I don't know if you know who's being who's funding those protests, but it happens to be George Soros. Oh, you knew that. Okay. Well, first some facts. George Soros? He's a wealthy billionaire that is using his money to press for socialism and the conversion of America to liberal ideology. 
Mm. Mm. Oh, see, that's how they rationalize it. Mm. You know, why are we so, you know, hard on Trump when Bill Clinton was just as bad? Or worse. It is the nature of politics mm -hmm. that the voters eventually become dissatisfied with their leaders and parties they elect and they elect a leader from a different party. It happened to the Republicans at the end of George Bush's tenure, and it's now happened at the end of eight years of President Obama. Because that's the way the nature of politics, that's the, that's the way politics are. People eventually get dissatisfied with it, and they vote in the other party. That's why you have to have two parties, as far as the Jesuits are concerned, because they can play on both. Oh yeah. And then they can use both to accomplish their purposes. And believe me, they will use Trump to accomplish their purposes as well. Anyway, uh, this gives them an opportunity to manipulate politicians in support their, of their own agendas. Mrs. Clinton should have known from the beginning that after eight years of President Obama, she was going to be in a difficult spot to try and win the election. She should have known that. But... The leftist media kept press presenting a picture of the race for president as if she was going to win it hands down. Mm -hmm. And this reassured her of mm -hmm. her in, in her own biases. Mm -hmm. The stunning upset of Hillary Clinton was spectacular. Mm -hmm. Not so much because Trump won the electorate with a wide margin of 306 to 232 of the electoral vote, but because the prognosticators, the analysts, the polls, and the media got it so wrong. The mainstream media depended on its own biases and on, and, and, uh, and on heavily biased polling to predict almost unanimously that Hillary was going to win the presidency. They ignored, ridiculed, and mocked those that disagreed with their consensus and predicted a Trump win. That's dangerous. That, and, and, and ever since then, they've been having a funk of their own, trying to sort out, uh, what did we do wrong? It's interesting. It's just amazing to watch this. In fact, one day I want to do a whole sermon on propaganda. Uh, I just haven't been able to put that one together yet, but it's 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 brewing. <laughs> I hope maybe one day we get to it. Anyway, there was one leftist media agency that broke from the pack. That was the Los Angeles Times. Instead of using live pollsters, which apparently made some voters sheepish about admitting that they were going to support Trump, the LA Times used polling data from the internet where people felt more free to say what they really think. You wonder why that is, but that's, that's the way we are. We're willing to say things on Facebook, for instance, that we would never say otherwise. You know, huh? Yeah, you, you know, people are right out there on Facebook. They're fools. <laughs> Absolutely foolish. But anyway, that's what happened. Also, many of the polls did not get a true cross-section of rural America, especially. They took their polling data from polls taken in New York, Washington and from the states on the West Coast, which are inevitably liberal and eventually inevitably supportive of Clinton in this case, like California, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington. I might add that there was one other prognosticator that also predicted a Trump presidency 16 years ago. 16 years, that's prognosticator. 16 years ago, predicted a Trump presidency by name. Wow. <laughs> Ever heard of the cartoon series called The Simpsons? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 They ran a show in 2000 that had Bart trying to see his future. <coughs> Lisa Simpson, his sister, in the future, is the president of the United States. A female. Ooh. It wasn't quite time yet. We had to have Trump before a female. Anyway. <laughs> she says, as she's sitting in her Oval Office, as you may know, 
we had inherited quite a budget crunch from President Trump. Hmm. How bad is it, Secretary Van Houten? Van Houten responds by saying, we're broke. The Simpsons cartoons have predicted the future at least 10 times in its history. But the cartoon also shows a fictionalized Trump coming down an escalator that strikingly looks like the escalator he uses in the Trump Tower in New York. And it also shows his familiar hand movements and his golden shock of hair, you know, and all the things that they like to make a cartoon out of. While I don't put much stock in the Simpsons prognostications, Simpsons, I have never watched them, actually. I think it is the only the only program, I didn't even see the whole program, but I did watch the thing on the, the clip on Donald Trump. Um, anyway, I think it's ironic that they picked Trump as a future president. Not only that it is even more, not only that it is even more ironic that the nation is broke after a Trump president. <laughs> <laughs> Now think about this. What spirit prophecy statements might have some application here? One could be forgiven for wondering whether there is some spiritualistic manifestations going on there. Watch out for the Simpsons. I would not spend a lot of time watching them if I was you. Amen. Let me also point out this in this context that there is a very interesting and truly prophetic statement from the book Evangelism, page 235. Let me read it to you. When Protestant churches shall unite with a secular power to sustain false religion, mm -hmm. then will the papal Sabbath be enforced by the combined authority of church and state. Have mercy. There will be a national apostasy which will end in only in national, national ruin. Now let's tie that in. How did Donald Trump become president? How did it happen? Who supported him more than anybody else? No, no, it wasn't well. <laughs> Thank you, sister. The evangelicals. The evangelicals supported Donald Trump undyingly, in spite of all his foibles and mistakes and yes. immoralities. And anyway, we'll get to that. Hang on. In the wake of Donald Trump's astonishing upset victory, media outlets went into meltdown. They had flooded the predictions in seismic fashion. All the data, all the models, all the predictions were all wrong. How could this happen? And how could the media gurus be so wrong? They were so smug, so sure of themselves, so self-righteous when it came to predicting a Clinton victory, and even derided their own liberal colleagues at the LA Times. The Trump victory dealt a devastating blow to the credibility and ex of the media and the leftist media and exposed something that the media had studiously tried to hide. <coughs> what was that? What is clear now, especially in the light of the undercover videos done by Project Veritas of Democrats admitting to stoking violence at Trump rallies, <coughs> which the media tried to ignore, is that they do not report journalistic facts unbiased and even-handedly. They report in support of their own agendas, often left leftist and globalist yeah. agendas. Look, Adventists don't understand that globalization is the formula for their own death penalty. Come on now. The, they don't realize that, that you cannot have a global worship system without global uh, global political order and global economic order and global educational order. All these things are being constructed under Obama and George Bush and Bill Clinton and all these presidents before them. Not just these, not the American presidents alone, but the 
leaders of other, especially Western nations, but through the United Nations they do this. This is all about preparing for the fulfillment of Revelation chapter 13, which says that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. That's global religion. You can't have a global religion in the New World Order unless you have the New World Order in other areas as well. Okay, so many Adventists don't realize what's going on. They just vote with their emotions. They vote with their, act, their, their feelings, you know. Now with their credibility seriously undermined, perhaps the media were the biggest losers outside of the Clinton campaign itself. Mm. While Donald Trump was smearing Hillary Clinton, <laughs> he sure did a lot of that, the mainstream media did everything they could to smear the Donald. So much so that they made the mistake, perhaps, of playing right into his own hands. They mocked him, they derided him, they accused him, they, this, their spin fell on deaf ears, but at the same time, it made many people more sympathetic to Donald Trump. Hmm. Most of Trump's supporters see him as imperfect, but genuine. Hmm. They see him as willing to stand up to the establishment elites and to stand with them rather than aloof from them. They see him as the best alternative in light of Hillary's questionable behavior. The mainstream liberal... By the way, Benghazi is still not going away. Are you aware of that? You'd think that Benghazi would have died and gone a long time ago. It's still around. And I'll tell you what I, my take on it, even though I, I have no evidence of this. This is pure speculation, but it's what I think. I think the Benghazi thing, which caused the, the ambassador to be murdered, was a Uriah moment. Hmm. Mm. I knew it. You know what a Uriah yeah. moment is? Yeah. When King David told the soldiers to pull back on Uriah and allow him to be killed so he could marry Bathsheba. Well, I don't think Hillary's going to marry some woman. But anyway, what I mean is, she did not appreciate that man for some reason. I don't know why. I have no, no understanding of this issue. But when she told the Marines to stand down, that means that they pulled back and they did not defend him. That's just my take. Poor man, I, I feel badly for him and his family, but this is, this is the thing, with geopolitical things, you cannot, you, you, you are risking your life when you get involved with them. So the mainstream liberal media just didn't get it. They did not want a politically conservative president, no matter what, and they bent every effort to make sure it didn't happen. And uh, every political, they used every political pundit they could, every member of the elite that they could engage, and every political tool they had in their arsenal. And amazingly, Trump overcame them all. So, with their credibility at stake, the media went into a funk, as I said, <laughs> trying to figure out what happened. I won't get it. Let's skip the rest of that. Except to say that Margaret Sullivan of the Washington Post made this comment. She said the media didn't want to believe Trump could win. So they looked the other way. They did not take rural America seriously. Make no mistake, Sullivan said. This is an epic failure. And then she quoted Peter Thiel, the gay founder of PayPal, and an influential billionaire. The media is, he said this, the media is always taking Trump literally, and it never takes him seriously. But it always takes him literal. The journalists wanted to know exactly how he would deport the many undocumented immigrants, mm -hmm. or exactly how Trump would rid the world of the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. we, we wanted details. But a lot of voters think the opposite way. They take Trump seriously, but not literally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's rather insightful. Now, none of, this has to do with prophecy in the sense that it sets the stage for what, for, for what Trump is being given the mandate to do. All right? I'm giving you a little thumbnail of how he became president so you understand the mandate. It reminds me of a funny statement, though, that I've adapted for this use. 
You may have heard something like this before. I've abandoned my search for truth because I've found a good lie. <laughs> and with one notable exception, the media was feeding on its own self-deception. Did you know there's a Bible text to go with that? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 says, Because they do not love the truth, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, then they should believe a lie. I'll say no more about the media. Not only did Donald Trump take on Hillary Clinton, oh, forget that. Let me get down to the nuts and bolts here. A rear match. Yeah. Now that you have the back row. Revelation 13. Come back to that again. Verse 11 says, I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Mm -hmm. And he exercises all the power of the first beast. What does this mean, all the power? What kind of power will the United States exercise? Friends, this is dictatorial power, religious dictatorial power. Right. Donald Trump has offered himself as the solution to America's problems. He is a businessman that is used to demanding compliance mm -hmm. with his plans and goals, mm -hmm. which makes him more of a dictator than a de democratic president. Amen. Amen. All right. Will he exercise dictatorial power through executive orders like President Obama has, President Bush has, and President Clinton did, and many presidents before then? Of course. Of course he will. It's a tool that presidents use to get their way. And what of Trump's obligations to the evangelical vote mm -hmm. who were so crucial to this no, victory? Do you think that they will not let him forget that they were the ones who put him in office? Mm -hmm. We have exchanged one assault on religious liberty from the secularists for another from the evangelicals. And this one is way more serious. Time will certainly tell where this will go mm -hmm. during the next four years to eight years. Eight years, maybe. We'll see. And what of Trump's obligation to the evangelical vote? Well, we need to understand something very important. Campaign rhetoric and realities of the geopolitical situation can be quite different. Yes. Keep in mind that voters cast their votes based on their personal situation. They voted for what they think will benefit them the most. Mm -hmm. They are not voting on some grand strategic vision about America's place and power in the world. They're voting on jobs and the economy, and that is what directly affects them. There will be geopolitical constraints that Mr. Trump will have to face if he tries to shred the deal with Iran or tear up the trade agreements across the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans, hmm. which he essentially said he would do. In hmm. fact, these things are not likely to happen, actually. The president, however, can be much more effective in, get this, adjusting domestic policy. Hello. Well, renegotiating foreign policy is much more difficult, and herein lies the danger. Mm -hmm. While on one hand, globalization will not suffer as much difficulty under Trump as all the tough talk suggested during the campaign, on the other, domestic policy may take a big swing away from its moorings on key social and moral issues mm. like well, abortion and separation of church and yes, state. Yes, you know. yes. While some things will be good, others will be quite the opposite, especially if the mob mentality that often arises in a democracy gains traction and calls for more strident and stringent requirements to satisfy religious demands. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. What do I mean by the mob mentality? Mm -hmm. Anytime you have a democracy rather than a republic, America started as a republic and it's become a democracy, mm -hmm. gradually, little at a time. It's become a democracy. Whenever you have a democracy, the mob eventually becomes the ruling power, and it leads straight into a dictator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think America is not going to become a dictatorship? Uh. 
So we need to understand this prophetic threat more carefully and more clearly. What I'm saying is that Donald Trump and his vice president, Mike Pence, have more potential to bring in religious laws as a national Sunday law with a Republican stacked Congress and a more conservative judiciary once they're in place than he does to dismantle the globalist process, which he despises. So what did I just say? What does he have? He's got, he's, he's, the Republicans are not only in charge of, of the White House in the new administration, it will also be in charge of both houses of Congress. And a lot of state legislators. Uh, we need more research on that. I need to know some more about that. I'd like to talk about that in future CDs. And when Trump appoints conservative judges to the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, okay, there'll be a lot of debate about abortion, a lot of de debate about same-sex marriage, a lot of debate about all these other things. But nobody is talking about Sunday laws. It's coming. It's coming. What do you think's on the mind of the evangelicals? Oh. Mike Pence is the most powerful Christian supremacist in American history, said one blogger. And Did you hear that? One blogger said Mike, uh, admittedly a leftist blogger, is very unhappy with this. He said Mike Pence is the most powerful Christian supremacist in American history. What is Christian supremacy? Okay. <laughs> that means Sunday laws. Evangelical. Oh, yeah. They think of Pence as one of the most valiant warriors in the Trump tr Trojan horse, as they call it. His strong Christian views are viewed by many as radical and right-wing. Pence and his associates want a God-led government and biblical capitalism. The economic system, of course, which they believe God endorses or ordains. Pence is also against abortion, certain gay rights, at least gay marriage, and believes in torture, warrantless surveillance, and no congressional oversight of the CIA. Wow. Jezebel, come again. <laughs> Pence was the chairman of the Republican Study Committee in 2005 to 2007, which is one of the largest Republican caucuses in Congress, which was organized with the purpose to well, to serve, I should say, the purpose of advancing conservative social and economic agenda in the House of Representatives. Conservative social agenda, that's religion. Yes. That's another word for religion. And <clears throat> the liberals understand this, and every student of prophecy ought to understand that. Amen. You see, there's both sides to deal with here. You have the liberals that tattle on the conservatives, and the conservatives that tattle on the liberals. Mm -hmm. So you've got to read both. Trump, uh, sorry, Pence's political action committee name, the name itself, tells us something about his orientation. Would you like to know the name? Oh, yeah, yeah. Principles exalt a nation. Ooh. Right. Will he be a Christian crusader? Of course. David Barton, a prominent Christian activist and president of Wall Builders, as in Nehemiah's wall, not the Mexican wall. <laughs> in an organization that's dedicated to making the United States government reflect biblical values in its public policy, said in June, this is David Barton, who you probably know from YouTube or whatever, he's done a lot of stuff. We may look back, he said, in a few years and say, wow, Trump really did some things that none of us expected. <laughs> Every student of prophecy knows what to expect. Isn't that right? Yeah. What would those unexpected things be? Would it surprise you? Some that voted for Trump um, 
might include Sunday worship in that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Sunday observance, which is associated with biblical values in the minds of most Christians, is yeah. not actually biblical at all, but is from the enemy and defiance of God. Mm -hmm. Will Rome still influence the world in favor of its social teachings and social constructs while they're worried about domestic things in America? With varying degrees of success, it will, and it remains a powerful influence on the United States domestic policy. Will Rome, however, find a friend in Mike Pence? Hmm. After all, he was raised a Catholic. Uh, uh, like they had with Joe Biden. He's now an evangelical. Uh -huh. Trump had a meeting with over a thousand evangelicals early in his campaign. Have you forgotten about that already? No. Huh? No, you haven't forgotten. Okay, good. Yep, yeah, a thousand of them. He let it be known that if they voted for him and he won the presidency, he would work to do away with the time-honored Johnson Amendment to the IRS That's code right. that prevents religious 501c3 organizations like churches and educational institutions from political advocacy and from endorsing candidates for public office. There you go. Very cool. What does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. The IRS adopted a, uh, an amendment Johnson. called the Johnson Amendment to the IRS Code. 501c3 organizations are not permitted to advocate for political individuals or political parties. Mm -hmm. Trump has vowed to overthrow that and give Christians more power. Okay. Now, where is that going? Where is that going to take us? Okay. Yeah, right down Revelation 13 road. The meeting was intended initially for about a hundred evangelical leaders, but it quickly grew to over a thousand after a tidal wave of interest. Former Republican presidential hopeful and former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee told Trump during the meeting, people had come because they want someone who will lead this nation out of the abyss. Mm -hmm. Woo-wee! Time to go back to the <laughs> And that's what a lot of people are doing. Get out of here, they say. This is going to go crazy over the next four years. I'm going to Canada. I'm going wherever. I'm getting out of this country. Yeah. They want to lead. Them. Now, what happens when evangelicals appoint a man to lead them out of the abyss? What abyss are they talking about? The moral corruption, the crime, the you know, economic problems, the jobs and trade, and all those things. Those are the things that they're talking about uh, leading out of the abyss. But in order to do that, what do they have to do? They have to get America back to God. And guess what happens, goes with that? Sunday laws. Sunday laws. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I can see this coming. I'm not saying that Trump's going to be the one. But I'm saying that he's, that it, look, it's all lining up. You've got the ecumenical movement maturing. You have globalization maturing. And now you have the mob mentality. And it's not just in America. It's also in Britain. Think yeah. Brexit. Yes. And Russia. And it's in the Philippines. Think yeah. Duterte, the man who's, who's determined to destroy anybody who does drugs. Kill him. Mm. Extrajudicial killing. It's already been three, more than 3,000 extrajudicial killing in the Philippines since he became president July 1. And that was already, that statistic was already a month ago. It's already a month old. So maybe it's another 1,000 people. It's, I'm telling you, all these things are maturing at the same time. And now we have Donald Trump playing on the mob mentality to establish a government that's built on evangelical ideas. Look, the evangelicals are really the only group of people that Trump really owes his allegiance. That's right. There's no other entity that was voting for him other than individuals. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're small entities. Not, not really significant ones. The evangelicals are the only significant group of people that Trump owes his allegiance. And they will not let him forget it. Mm -mm. After the meeting with the thousand evangelical leaders, Donald Trump then appointed a steering committee of religious leaders 
to assist him in navigating the campaign and beyond, including Tony Perkins, Family Research Council, James Dobson, who you wouldn't have known, yes. Bob Vander Plaats, Kenneth Copeland, yes. and Gary Bauer. Yes. Yes. Speaking of Kenneth Copeland, get this. Yes. On election night, he did a live web broadcast called America Stands, Election Coverage in the Spirit of Faith. Hmm. Copeland said, get this, that he will have direct access to the President of the United States because he is a member of Donald Trump's Faith Advisory Council. Hmm. So listen carefully to what he said. Hmm. He said, I have no doubt if something were to really strike my heart, if God really showed me something that I felt like and that the Lord would say, you deliver this, I have no doubt that I could deliver it, and that was not true of presidents past, even though we had some influence in some areas in some ways. I am totally convinced that if the Lord were to say something to me that the president needs to hear, he said, I have no doubt that we, would, that we could do it and do it quickly and have audience to say, thus saith the Lord, he, wasn't, he wouldn't just turn it over to an aide or something and just write it off. He would listen and it would mean something to him. When I heard that, chills went down my spine. Here is a Pentecostal who lives by his emotions. Who also thinks he hears God saying things to him. And what if God comes to him some well, God anyway, and yeah. says, you got to tell President Trump to get some Sunday laws going in here because America's not going to solve its problems until the Sunday laws are, are, are in force, until we get America back to God. So he goes quickly, he goes quickly into Donald Trump. Now what happens to the rap, the final movements? I almost gave it away. They are radical ones. Quickly. Hello. Remember, Kenneth Copeland is working very closely with the Pope to unite with Rome in a broad ecumenical alliance between Pentecostals and the Catholic Church. Will Kenneth Copeland play a part in preparing for the National Sunday Law in the United States with a direct line to the President? Do you have any idea how dangerous that would be for God's people? Remember, Pentecostalism is directly linked to spiritualism. Sure. You see how Satan's bringing this all together? Great controversy. Good night, sister. The miracle working power manifested through spiritualism will exalt its influence against those who choose to obey God rather than men. Communications from the spirits will declare that God has sent them to convince the rejectors of Sunday of their error, affirming that the laws of the land should be obeyed as the law of God. Mm. They will lament the great wickedness in the world in the second, and second the testimony of religious teachers that the degraded state of morals is caused by the desecration of Sunday. Mm. Great will be the indignation excited against all who refuse to accept their testimony. Who is this? The spirits. Mm. Let me tell you what, brothers and sisters, now with the circumstances that are unfolding at this very moment, that statement could very easily become true. It's a promise. And it could very easily come true. This is a great controversy, 590-91. After eight years of aggressive anti-Christian social agendas being pushed by the Obama administration, evangelicals are desperate to change the direction of America to a more conservative, religiously supported nation. But that brings with it some unneeded baggage. The unspoken question, the elephant in the room, so to speak, is whether evangelicals will use their newfound power to press for Sunday legislation. Now, it's not going to happen necessarily in the first month of President Trump's presidency. But he's got four years to work it out, and maybe eight. 
This is serious, my friend. This is very serious. This is a very dangerous man, not from a political or economic or racial point of view, but from a spiritual, biblical, and prophetic point of view. I'll tell you what, unless the angels of God hold back the winds of strife, Adventists are in trouble. Unfaithful Adventists are going to be in trouble. Trump effectively promised evangelicals that under his leadership things would be different for Christians in America. That can be very dangerous prophetic spe prophetically speaking. Trump has promised to dismantle the wall of separation between the church and state. He promised to give evangelicals the power to spend unlimited amounts of tax dollars on, uh, sorry, tax exempt money rather, on political candidates. These promises led to very strong support for Donald Trump's campaign and certainly influenced the end result. Mm -hmm. Trump said, I said, I'm going to take this into my own hands. And I'm going to, how much is he going to take into his own hands? Mm -hmm. Executive order is taking it into your own hands. That's really what yep. executive order is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take this into my own hands, and I'm going to figure a way that we can get you back your freedom of speech, he told the evangelical pastors on one occasion. Mm -hmm. It will be so great for the evangelicals, for the pastors, for the ministers, for the priests, mm -hmm. for America. That's what he said. That's a quote, a direct quote. Yeah. The power you have is enormous. He's talking to the evangelicals. Mm -hmm. It's not like you represent 2% of the country, and it's going to be difficult. You probably... You're probably 75 or 80 percent. Mm. If you want to be put, if, sorry, he went on to say, if you want to put your full weight, I mean, can you imagine if all of your people started calling up the local congressman and the local senator? That's a suggestion. Mm -hmm. He was saying, look, now that we've got it, you start doing this. Did you hear that about the priest, by the way? Nothing but the ecumenical movement of which these evangelicals are a part could have brought on those comments. Trump's rallies were more like faith-based festivals, said one pundit. This wasn't politics as an end, it was politics as a means to something else. Though it never became clear what that something else was. Could that, be, could that something else be Sunday legislation? Trump promised the evangelical pastors that by abolishing the prohibition on churches spending tax money on hmm. political advocacy, Mercy. it would reverse the slow, steady decline in church attendance hmm. and public attitudes toward Christian beliefs in the United States. Hmm. He said, and if you look at what's happened in religion, he said, if you look at what's happening into Christianity, and you look at the number of people going to churches, it's on a climb of slow and steady in the wrong direction. A lot of it has to do with the fact that you've been silenced. You've been silenced like a child has been silenced. Hmm. Friends, one of the key arguments for this future Sunday law is to get America back to God and back in church. And Trump appealed to church leaders on this basis. You have a chance to do something that will be earth-shaking, he said. I literally mean it. Earth shaking. You've got to get your people out to vote. You know, we think he's such a clown. A dunce. He's not a dunce. Look, I don't care. I don't know whether he's. he's obvious, I don't know if he's got a good IQ or not. The fact is, he is getting votes by bargaining with your future. That's what's happened. And he's easily manipulated by the ones he owes for the presidency. The arguments for the future Sunday law, to get America to get back to God, back to church, uh, you know, little did he realize that evangelical support for Sunday laws would cause a shaking in God's church as well. Come on. Hello. Think about this. Little does Trump realize that his push for Sunday laws, or, or for support for evangelicals, rather, 
means that if there is a Sunday law, it will cause a huge shaking in God's church. Amen. Because most of God's people are not ready for this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Evangelical megachurch pastor Robert Jeffress said the Bible has called for a strong man such as Trump in the White House. He may not be perfect, but he's ours. Ours? Whoa. He's ours. What ours? Trump a Christian? Trump. They own Trump, Trump, in other words. <laughs> Trump claims to be a Presbyterian. And he says, Christianity's done a lot for me. Okay. Well, then what he'd be if it hadn't. <laughs> Trump's proposal to change the 501c3 rules wasn't a mistake. It was a well-planned move designed to put him in the White House at the expense of a time-honored principle of the American Constitution, the separation of church and state, the wall of separation. Evangelicals are, happy about, are unhappy about being marginalized in American politics. Trump's response was, I will be the greatest representative of the Christians they've had in a long time, end quote. By the way, if you ever want this information and the original sources we use for this, just go on our website. When this, this is posted, this will be posted January 1. When this is posted on our website, you'll, you can also drill into the original articles through the links that we provide in our text, the text to our sermon. Is it conceivable that Trump will start to impose religious laws at some point during his presidency? Well, all this is unclear at this point in time. We are looking at a potential crisis for God's people should circumstances unfold in such a way as to open the door for evangelicals to demand Sunday legislation. Just think about how suddenly all the elements are now ripe. They are all stacked in favor of religious legislation should there be a catalyst that would push America over the edge. Mm. Here's another thing to think about at the dawn of the Trump presidency. The United States has been steadily moving away from the rule of law toward the rule of the mob. The rule of the mob always leads to the rule of a dictator. When the Bible says that America will act like Rome and the exercise of power, we will soon see the fulfillment of all the prophecies described in Revelation 13 come to pass. It may or may not be during the Trump presidency, but the circumstances are clearly being staged. The anger of most Americans toward their rulers is what propelled Donald Trump to the White House. And although it wasn't so much that all those Trump voters really want Trump, it's that they think that anything is better than Obama and Clinton. Clinton was seen as one of the establishment elites. She has she was seen as one of the same political of the same political cloth as President Obama. And now that the voters have handed Trump the White House and the Republican Party, the House of Representatives, and the Senate, there is no doubt that they have given Donald Trump a mandate to act in their interests. Now that the U.S. Constitution has been undermined substantially in the last 16 years, um, what is to stop Donald Trump from his own form of authoritarian rulership? My friends, the Bible says that it is God of heaven that rules over the kingdoms of men. It is the Most High that sets up kings and takes them down. Listen to this from Daniel 4, verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, said Nebuchadnezzar, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. This is saying that the holy angels watch over the kingdoms. This tells me that the angels are watching this election. But it is also clear that God sets up rulers and often they are the basest of men. They are the most mm. selfish, most corrupt, and the most immoral. Mm. Even politically conservative rulers are often the most hypocritical. Mm. And they're put in power to test them and see how they will lead. God's purposes are often hidden in the shadows, mm. my friends, and it is not wise for us to get involved in any political schemes. Mm. We may well 
end up fighting God, or at least engaging with people who will fight God. And frankly, if I was amazed at how many of God's people actually voted. Politicians change. Oh yes. They say one thing to do another. Trump has already backed away from some of his key pillars in his platform. And that's even before he became president. We need to be watching heaven, my friends, through Bible prophecy. Amen. Not the latest polls. It is Bible prophecy that accurately describes what to expect from presidents and prime ministers. Amen. And what is that? The collaboration with the papacy and with the merchants of the earth to array the world against God's law. Yeah. Think about it. There is no other destiny. That's why the United States president, the Federal Reserve Banks, worked to help Goldman Sachs and other key banks during the economic crisis of 2008. They're bringing them into line against God. They're working together to keep the illicit relationship between the merchants of the earth and the papacy strong. Goldman is closely tied to the bank. Wake up is right. I thought it was rather ironic Prophetically ironic that just before the election, Time magazine displayed a cover that featured both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton holding a sign that said, The end is near. Did you see that one? You didn't? You don't read Time magazine. That's because you don't read both sides. Maybe. No, they had. It, magazine was red, in, in Time Magazine's red color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the whole background was red, and here was Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton standing next to each other, both of them holding a sign, one with one hand, the other with the other, that said, the end is near. Mm -hmm. And this was just before the election. Of course, they were talking about yeah. the election. Right. Friends, I oh. took much deeper oh, significance yeah, to that sign on yeah. Time Magazine. Do you think that was prophetic? Yeah. Of course it is. Yeah. Though Time editors probably had no idea how prescient that picture was. And while Donald Trump doesn't have a lot of political favors from interest groups to repay, he must repay the evangelicals. He's coming to, to the presidency at a time of great danger. Terrorism still targets Americans. War in the Middle East continues. Economic issues are straining the nation's finances. And a new spirit of mob behavior is growing. And the ecumenical movement has nearly reached its maturity. Social problems continue to make an impact on the thinking of people. Some very big issues are at stake. How will Trump <coughs> react to these things? How will the evangelicals that put him in office pressure him? How will the Vatican pressure him? The Vatican is always in play in American politics, as you probably know. No matter who's president, they're already planning their strategy. In fact, the bishops have already begun to urge Mr. Trump to adopt humane policies toward immigrants and refugees. Look, the Catholic Church mm. understood that he would not be able to achieve his promises. Mm. So they didn't get all frazzled about arguing and fighting over the political uh, thrust of Tari going on. No, no. They sat back and they said, now when this is all over, we're going to move in and we're going to start talking to Donald Trump. Mm. And they're already starting to do that. They know that building a wall is economically and politically not viable. So they rose above the rhetoric and strategically placed themselves in position to influence Donald Trump when he does become president. Friends, where are we? Where are we? And how should we live? Perhaps that's the most important question. In light of all these things, how then should we live? This is the question. Are we going to continue living halfway in, halfway out? Getting along most of the time, but sinning once in a while, and then excusing it? Or are we going to repent in dust and ashes? and ask Jesus to take over our lives because we don't have a lot of time left. I'm sorry. And I pray that you will heed the warning of the election.
election of Donald Trump to a very dangerous presidency. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we realize that we're at the very end and that time is short and that the final movements will be rapid ones. Father in heaven, forgive us for our negligence and our dilatory behavior when it comes to our own spiritual life, myself included. So Father, take us tonight. At the beginning of this new week, we dedicate ourselves to you. Use us. Transform us. And make us what you want us to be. And may we be faithful.